There was just nothing to explain it, nothing. It was just very, very scary. You are about to see real people. This is not normal. Reliving horrifying paranormal encounters for the first time. We just sat there with our jaws dropped. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. When spirits are intent on doing evil. The basement is super old and creepy. I buried this for nearly 30 years. Be prepared to be afraid. Story number 14 featuring Mandy. Take one. My name is Mandy Lynn, and I am co-owner of Liberty Tattoo in Libertyville and here in Antioch. Um, we took over the building in May of 2007. When we first saw the space, you know, we'd realized the capstone on the outside said it was built in 1904. There's a lot of history in the building. History that would come back to haunt them. It started with their renovations. Seeing someone or something didn't like their taste. We would close at the end of the night. You know, we'd get in the next day and there's paintbrushes missing or rollers missing or... The art that we bought came with glass in them. So we decided to put them behind the counters um, and bolted them to the wall with the wiring to the frame, like um, secured them to the wall. The first plate glass picture had fallen off the wall and was down on the ground and the glass was busted everywhere. Uh, we just chalked it up as not being hung properly. The next day when the second one was down, um, we knew that something else was going on. And then it was the last picture that had glass in it, had come down and was broken. We put it upright. There's no reason why it should have just fallen off the wall. Soon after opening, Mandy and Eric noticed signs of an unexpected visitor. When we opened for business, and the first thing that we noticed is that there were large male bear footprints on top of our display cases that are three and a half feet off of the ground. I was trying to rack my brain who would have been walking around barefoot on the floor, which would have been more reasonable than on top of the counter. And then their employees started acting strangely. The boy employees just were terrified to come into the basement. We have stuffed supplies down here that I'd have to send them downstairs in the basement to get, and they would fight over, no, you go, no, you go, I'm not going into the basement. The basement is super old and creepy. There's a certain area uh, where the concrete is dirt, and it was either dug up or never filled in, and we found that to be very unusual and wonder what's buried there. You know, the first time I saw the hole in the floor, I just was trying to figure out why you would pour concrete everywhere else in this basement except for that one space and what was particularly special about that one spot. Mandy and Eric discovered that they weren't the first to feel a male entity in their midst. They learned he even had a nickname. Actually, one of my neighbors used to work in the space. She came in and we had metal ladders leaned up against the front door to the basement. And she said, you need to be careful because there's plate glass in that door. And I said, no, it, it's just wood. It's just painted. And she said, no, we painted over the glass because Lloyd used to stare through the window, standing on the stairs and peer through that window. And that was directly behind the counter where all the employees sat. So she said, we just painted the windows because it was freaking us out looking over there and seeing him standing there. It made me a little creeped out knowing that he was here. To me, it was very obvious that he likes women quite a bit. Even with myself, he would stand behind me and breathe. He 
even with me sitting in my chair, you could just feel him behind me. But there were multiple times where customers, female customers, would be across the room looking through flash, the tattoo flash racks, and there's no one behind them, and you could watch them go. You know, and I'd say, are you okay? And they're like, was there someone just standing behind me? And I'm like, no. The racks would just open one leaf at a time, very, very slowly all by themselves until a particular sheet of flash was shown which had a bunch of angels on them. Usually it was a female client would turn around in a panic and look at us and we'd smile and wave and nod and, yeah, I see it too. But... After a while, it, it got to be a little bit much, so we put in cameras. One day, our employees called us and said, what the hell happened here last night? And he said, there's a sign ripped off the wall. One of the pictures is down off the wall. And the plant, which is a very large plant and a very large planter, was tipped completely over. Um, and my husband and I reviewed the security tapes. At about 9.30 in the morning, all at the same time, the sign to the handicapped bathroom fell off the wall, ripping off the drywall sheeting with it, fell off the wall. The picture dropped off of the wall, and the plant planter just tipped over. There was no one in the studio. Like, our studio was not even open yet. The alarm was still set. The spirit may destroy somebody's belongings or hide them. Mostly, it's to get their attention, to let them know they're there, um, or that if they want something and you're not paying attention to them, they're going to get your attention one way or another. Soon, Mandy had other visitors. There's a little girl in here, a little girl spirit. The first couple times I saw her, she was just very playful. She would hide between the couches. She would play all over the studio. I, I always have been a believer of paranormal. I've experienced too many things, seen too many things, felt too many things for me to say nothing else is going on. But one of Mandy's visitors wasn't exactly harmless. One day I was taking a nap. Activity, strange presences, ghosts, and falling objects. But no one had been physically attacked yet. And as I was sleeping, I could feel that I was being pulled by my feet down across the couch. And when I opened my eyes, I realized that there was no one there. There was just no one there, but I could feel myself being pulled down the couch. And that's when I freaked out. And my husband came flying into the room, and he's like, what the hell is wrong? And I'm like, that thing just drug me down the couch. And he's like, are you OK? And I said, yes. Are you hurt? No, but a little freaked out that the thing can actually move me. The attack prompts Mandy and Eric to bring in paranormal investigator. Bob Jensen. So we came in here looking to see if we had any real high EMFs. We also used the audio recorders, digital recorders, to see um, what kind of audio we would be able to pick up down here. Uh, with different pictures that we took, most of them came up on the full color spectrum camera that we had anomalies that would pop up. We had a couple that showed up near a floodlight. There was actually a figure standing there. The pictures themselves were captured at the far end of the basement. Seeing the sheer size of Lloyd was very unnerving to 
I very much get the feeling that he's a sexual predator. And then to see him in that form was, made me very, very uncomfortable. It definitely has a uh, male physique to it. And there was a series of photographs. It looks like he's standing. And then the next picture looks like he's going into a crouching position. Uh, a couple more photos, it looks like he was sitting on um, almost like a crate or box. It's creepy as hell. I mean, this was like a more primal form, just a male shape, but very large, very powerful shape. They also caught a voice on tape. On the audio recordings, one was a little girl's voice. Um, the little girl's voice was warning us. She said, be careful, he's coming. You know, be careful, he's coming. She kept saying, be careful. Bob researched the history of the building and discovered a chilling story. There were claims that there might have been um, different crimes that were committed at this particular property. But the crimes against women that might be tied in with this particular location definitely goes back to the 19-teens um, and to maybe up until the 1930s or 1940s. For sure, finding out the history and that um, there was possible rape and killing down here made a lot of sense because there's one particular spot in the basement that it's very hard for women to be near without feeling very uncomfortable. And when you ask every single one of them kind of what are you feeling, they feel like uh, victimized sexually. With this building, a lot of these field stone, there's also limestone and quartz. And limestone and quartz have been uh, reported to actually hold on to residual hauntings. This is definitely a good catalyst for holding on to and retaining a lot of information that's happened over numerous, numerous decades. With minerals such as quartz and, and limestone, things like that, I'm not sure if it's an attraction for spirits, but they can use the energies from those things. It can also trap energy as well. So if a foundation is built upon these things, it's, it could fuel uh, more paranormal activity. Mandy and Eric don't need any more convincing and quickly take action. After the investigation, we asked a couple of our friends who are spiritual healers and um, work with energy to come into the space and help us try and clear out the energy that was here. We had a couple of people come in that used sage sticks and smudge sticks and just asked the entities that if there was something that they needed or if there was some help that we could give them to move to another place. they did seem to work. I don't think the little girl was here any longer at all. I think Lloyd hung out a little longer. It took him a little longer to move on. I find it very important that we had the space cleansed and the spirits cleared because I don't know if I would have been comfortable staying or any of the other employees would have been comfortable staying much longer. Not all spirits are evil like Lloyd, but even the nicer ones can turn malevolent when the living try to take what's theirs. Story number 18, featuring Tammy, take one. We bought the house in 2003. The feeling we got when we went in, it was just a positive feeling in the beginning. We just kind of knew that that was the place to be. All right, let's get to work. It was a small community. We knew um, we were going to try and have a child. Yeah, that's great. But Tammy's rosy outlook quickly starts to pale. I put a 
week after we moved in, and my husband was alone in the house for the first time. He said that he heard yeah. um, a banging on the wall coming closer and closer. Hello? Tammy Northcutt and her husband, Jerry, had recently moved into a new home. Within the first week, Hello? they were hearing strange noises. He said that he heard a banging on the wall coming closer. There was nothing there. Next, it was Tammy's turn to start hearing things. In the middle of the night, um, I got up because I heard arguing, and I didn't know where it was coming from. But the, we've got a vent that's in our living room, um, a heater vent. And um, you could tell that it was coming up from there. We would go down in the basement to find out what was going on. We could never see anything. It was just constantly just there, you know, but there was nothing. There was nothing. You couldn't see anything, but you could hear it. The objective for spirits making themselves known could be a number of things. It could be they have a message they want to pass on. Others don't know they're passed on, so they're trying to interact. They're trying to be a part of the living world. The couple suffered in silence until help arrived by pure chance. There was a shop um, downtown Janesville. We, we met um, the couple. We were talking about the house, and they overheard us talking. And they said, we can help. They said that they could come bless the house. They blessed the house, and the things stopped for a while. The house seemed to settle down. 18 months later, Tammy and Jerry had their first child, Connor. As soon as my son was born, it started up again, the knocking. The cabinet doors in the kitchen, um, you can hear open and close. And um, well, the basement door started opening and closing. My son's door was opening and closing. It started to kick up again. These mysterious events continued until after Connor's second birthday. Then they turned more sinister. Connor started seeing something on his bed that he referred to as Mr. Raider. He would tell me that I need to get Mr. Raider off the bed. I would look. I could not see anything. And then another unwelcome guest paid a visit. An old woman who would shake his bed in the middle of the night. That's when he would come running to our room about 2 a.m. It got to the point where he just refused to go into the room. My husband's mother had passed away before Connor was born, but we do have a picture of her. 
And he kept on looking at her picture, and he asked me to tell her to stop waking him up in the middle of the night. Soon after that, Tammy had a terrifying moment. I heard the door close, and Connor was in the room. Connor? And I was frantic. Connor? Hey! I didn't know what to do. I couldn't get the door open, and I just, I my son was in there, and I had to get to him. And I was actually going to call the fire department to have them come remove the door. I was, I was so scared. And the door clicked, and I reached and I turned the knob, and it opened. And I was able to get him out. After that, um, we took the handle off the door so it could no longer latch. Tammy and her husband were at a breaking point. They reached out for help a second time. I've been investigating since the 90s, about 1997. They were scared. They really were. Our first investigation there probably produced the most evidence out of any single one investigation we've ever done anywhere. <sighs> Throughout the night, we had what we call Class C EVPs, electronic voice phenomenon. But there were some times that we got what we call Class A EVPs where we could hear exactly what it was saying. Stop saying that. Get out. Get out. Come get us. Stop saying that. We had something we thought growled at us. And all of a sudden, we hear, wow, wow. Our first impression was that we were dealing with something very negative. This thing is saying, I'm the boss here. A few days later, the entity reveals a violent side. I felt somebody choke me. There was, there was pressure on my neck. Tammy Northcutt and her husband sensed an evil force in their home. Their son, Connor, was being traumatized, and Tammy herself had felt attacked by some entity. I felt somebody choke me. There was, there was pressure on my neck, and it felt like there was hands around my neck, like I was being strangled. Baby, hey. And it was almost like I was being pushed into the bed, but, um, and then I felt like a release and I was able to sit up. But um, it was, it was awful. It was an awful feeling. Tammy asked the paranormal group to come back. This time they brought Paul, their most gifted psychic. He came over and he was getting messages already from before he even got to our house. The first thing Paul picked up was that the house had once been a seedy drinking den. He's talking about this this place being, you know, where there's drunk people and he makes the sound of one guy that just continually goes ar 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 and I about fell off my stool when he did that because it sounded just like what we heard. Our biggest question was who was saying, come get us, and who told us to get out? 
I was telling him about where Connor was seeing Mr. Raider. I, I showed him the room. And he told us it wasn't Mr. Raider, it was Mr. Reader. And he, and in the 1930s, um, there was like a traveler's lodge that sat where our house is now. He said Mr. Reader owned the hotel. And Paul's theory is, is that Mr. Reader is hanging out in the master bedroom area. And he's not a very nice guy. And he's probably the one that told us to get out. Finally, they could put a name to this sinister spirit. He started talking to Mr. Reader as he was explaining to Mr. Reader that this is a different time, women are equal. The light started to brighten up in the room and it felt lighter in the room. And now I don't have that negative feeling anymore. That's gone. Paul had cleansed the house of the malevolent spirit, but still had some questions. He asked Jerry um, what the word, the name Dell meant. And he said, well, that it's Della, that was my mom. She had passed away. And that's um, who was following Connor around. The female spirit who had been waking Connor, Tammy's mother-in-law, wasn't trying to frighten him. She was trying to protect him. It was her voice that Tammy heard among the arguing in the basement. I actually kind of felt a little comforted knowing that she was looking out for him. Every once in a while, you'll still hear the door slamming in the back and the uh, heavy footsteps going down the stairs. Um, but knowing um, what I know now because of Paul, um, I do feel better. And kind of knowing that um, I'm not going to get harmed, I'm not going to get hurt, I think makes me feel more comfortable. Sometimes ghosts may haunt the living out of vengeance, perhaps due to tragedy, a life cut short. These vindictive spirits can harbor ill intentions, even when their victims are the innocent. Paranormal Survivor 2, Michael's Haunted Apartment, story number four. Take one. That was 2005, and a couple friends of mine, uh, longtime friends, bought a building that had had a fire, uh, and they decided to renovate it. After his friends finished renovating, they offered to rent Michael one of the apartments. When I moved in, it felt cozy. It was, it was a comfortable little place. I thought something I, I could live in for a while. My father's Look around. I actually uh, had my stepson who was living with me at the time. My kids would come over on the weekends. Um, so it was a small apartment. But that was it, just him and I. Michael's initial cozy feeling would quickly fade. Strangeness in this apartment started about three days in. We started hearing the cabinet doors in the kitchen. And like someone was opening them just enough so they tap, tap, tap. So 
So went in to check it out, could never find out what was going on. Um, I had an exterminator come, and because I thought maybe there was mice or something, but there wasn't. Uh, so I had no explanation for it at that point. It was shortly after that, other things started to happen. The stereo would blast on at 3.20 in the morning, every single morning, and it would be full blast. I thought maybe my son was goofing around with me and turning it on. And with everything else that was going on, I started to believe him that he wasn't. The electric would go on and off. It would flicker. And um, just weird things we'd hear banging on the wall. And just there was no reason for it. I was the only apartment on that end, so nobody could bang on the wall. So we started to figure out that something strange was going on. There was three different times that I would try to look up the history of this building to find out what might have happened. And every time I would type in to start looking, my computer would drop off. Nothing else would die, all the rest of the power stood on, just the computer would go off. It was a brand new computer. I brought it into the service guy three different times. He finally yelled at me and told me don't come back because there was nothing wrong with it. Something in the building did not want Michael to know its secrets. I didn't make any connection to the fire at all. I just thought, I thought our minds were playing with us. So I thought that, you know, we were missing something that, you know, at some point we were gonna say, ah, that's what it was and laugh about it. I had rented a movie, and in this movie, in the end, there was extras, and it showed how to do EVP. So we thought, well, let's try it. EVP, or electronic voice phenomena, are believed to pick up sounds from the spirit world. One night after recording, and we pick something up. Nope. Anyone? Then listen in. Here we go. What we uh, got first was like growling. We'd hear growling on it, like uh, kind of like demonic type. Uh, growls, and my son at the at, at one point said, "Go to the light, go to the light," you know. Get away from the light. You could hear like a man's voice, a demonic type man's voice. I started picking and poking and trying to make them mad, and I said, uh, "Oh, I'm gonna have a cigarette." I had said, uh, do you want a, a cigarette? I said, you can't have any, um, you're dead. And when we played the tape back, this little girl on the tape said, so who cares? And it was as clear as day. So who cares? And I'm thinking a little girl on the other side that don't care. This is dangerous. just stuck up on end. I couldn't believe it. I said, wow, this is real. I 
invited a, a woman over to uh, watch a movie, have some dinner with me one night, and I never told her anything because, you know, I wasn't sure exactly what was happening. And a picture of my kids, it came off and it flew across the room and then slammed against the radiator. And we kind of laughed it off and played it off. And um, I walked her out to her car and uh, walking her out, I started telling her what's been going on. And you know, she acted like she was interested, but I think she thought I was crazy. And when I walked back into the apartment, a horseshoe came off the wall that I had screwed into the plastered wall. It came off the wall and it just skinned my head. I mean, just thrown at me like somebody was, you know, like somebody was angry and just threw it at me. At this point, I'm not feeling too good about the apartment at all. I'm now worried about my kids' safety. Um, when all the kids were over, I had four kids, so there was times when um, they would be camping out in the living room floor. And that's where you may come in. If you drive the tank, APC, or other heavy wheeling vehicle across the tracks and other than prepared cars, you may be knocking the rails out of the lane. That makes it hard to train. Whatever you do, make sure you take the hand. And uh, there was a few times that they would hear, like, banging on the floor around them. And, you know, I didn't know what to tell them. So we started all sleeping together, um, camping out on the living room floor together. And my stepson walks in the room and he says, Dad, do you see this? Because I heard a lot of clicking, but I didn't pay attention to it. I looked up and the mouse on the computer was moving. and the mouse on the computer was moving and it was clicking stuff. And we just sat there with our jaws dropped. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. Was the home finally ready to give up its secrets? Spirits being made up of energy can manipulate electronics quite easily. A computer is no different. I've done two cases where it has happened. I also worked another case where spirit actually were able, things were actually typed out on the computer. And sure enough, there was a picture of the newspaper. The building was, you know, burnt up, the fire trucks in front of it, and there was a little story on it. Talked about how the fire started and how the smoke poured through the building, and that there was uh, two deaths in the building. There was a little girl and her father who lived in my apartment. And when the fire broke out, the little girl hid in my closet. But she hid in there. The father apparently died in the hallway. She died in the closet of the building. At that point, um, the computer went out again. Uh, I felt very uneasy when I read that. It seemed like they were getting more comfortable with us, and they were doing, you know, more and more was happening as, as we went along. I don't care what you want. I want you gone. I started to provoke them. I would just say horrible things to them, like, you know, you're dead, you don't belong here, your life's over, get out of my apartment, 
I'm going to call somebody in here. We're going to get you. You're going to go. I threatened to get a priest in there. I threatened to bless the place and all these things. And every time I did that, the lamp would get real bright. I mean, almost where you're waiting for the bulb to blow up. I mean, that's how bright it would get. Then it would go back down dim again. And so I could tell I was starting to touch some nerves somewhere. Michael's threats had no effect. This letter A that formed on the wall was in a ball of light, like a spotlight. And in the middle was a dark, shadowy A on there. It turns out the little girl that lived there, her name was Angela. People who die suddenly and tragically often don't necessarily realize that they've passed on. Therefore, they're going to go back to the place that's most familiar to them. I had goosebumps all over my body, and it scared the hell out of me. The last straw came almost two months in, in this apartment. I woke up one morning, and I smelled something burning. That's what woke me up, and I noticed it was too bright. I looked, and the blinds were gone off the window. I sat up and looked, and clear across the room, these blinds were laying on my electric heater, melting. And I was the only one home that day. These blinds were screwed into the wall, the wood frame of the window, and uh, you would have to take off caps you would have to take off four screws, and then you would have to lift them off to take them off. And I didn't hear any of that happening while I was sleeping. I started packing. I said, that's it. It's, that was the end of it. I packed up that day. Uh, I packed up quick and left. I have no doubt in my mind it was connected, and I think I ticked them off enough where they were willing to bring me with them, because that's, obviously, they were trying to burn the place down again. I mean, that's sort of, I mean, why else would you put plastic on a heater? After that, my friend Frank, who owned the building, he decided he would move in, he would take my apartment. He lasted there about a month. And then a month later, the building was up for sale. And I tried to talk to these guys. Why? He said they, had, they fixed it up. Why'd they sell it? They, they won't tell me. I think I know, though. 